so that you can get the message. Our orders backed up by the master Jesus are to refuse to have anything to do with those among you who are lazy and refuse to walk the way we taught you. Don't permit them to free load on the rest. We showed you how to pull your weight when we were with you. So get on with it. We didn't sit around on our hands expecting others to take care of us. In fact, we worked our fingers to the bone. Up half the night, moonlighting, so you wouldn't be burdened with taking care of us. And it wasn't because we didn't have a right to your support. We did. We simply wanted to provide an example of diligence, hoping it would prove contagious. Don't you remember the rule we had when we lived with you? If you don't walk, you don't eat. Say to your neighbor, if you don't work, you don't eat. And now we're getting reports that a bunch of lazy good-for-nothings are taking advantage of you. This must not be tolerated. We command them to get to work immediately. No excuses. No arguments. And earn their own keep. Can we go home now? Kai. You know, you read certain scriptures and you wonder where they have been. Did they just introduce this in the Bible? It's been there all along. But because we often read our greed into his creed, when we open it, we never see it. Our eyes are withholden because of the state of our hearts. This morning, I'm going to make you very uncomfortable. Let me say this to Lighthouse. Based on this scripture, it is a sin for you to support lazy people and freeloaders. I'm not saying it's a sin to help. But those who just think they can freeload and just take advantage of you because you shared a testimony about a breakthrough. Suddenly knocking on your door, wanting their own share without understanding the process, not understanding that you didn't get there just by freeloading, but you labored with your own hands. Now, here is what hits me in the scripture that the great apostle Paul would talk about toiling. And uses a word that we usually don't want in the vocabulary of our Christianity. Toil and labor. Day and night. To set an example. That will be contagious. That everybody else can catch on and toil and labor. Day and night. There are two kinds of toil. One is physical, the other is mental. Maybe there's a third one, there's a spiritual one. Three dimensions of toil. And I believe that the three needs to be activated in you and fully engaged if you truly must live above bar and must live above circumstances every single moment of your life. Say to your neighbor, toil and labor day and night. Not only day, but night as well. Too many times, we do not even understand the limits of a capacity because you never push it. I know that this may not be the best of illustrations, but I remember when I bought my first car, first model vehicle, it was out of work I had done. i like people to know my father didn't buy me my first car. It was a fruit of labor. My father bought me a car when I was getting married. But it was not my first.
was a Toyota Carina 2. It was a beautiful car then. It wasn't brand new, it was used. There are days of small beginnings. I get what I'm saying. The speed limit on the dashboard was 220. No, it was 200. And I wanted to find out. <laughs> You're laughing. I wanted to find out if the engine could really uh, be in a used car if it could hit 200. Before you put your hand up, let me finish. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then I had to be going to site because there was a construction project it was doing for Intercity Bank. And I had to be going to site every Monday. And I remember one day I pressed the throttle until the needle got to 200. And I said, okay, can get there. Let me stop. But this is where I'm going. When you get married, your speed reduces. When you have the first child, it will reduce further. When you have the second child, it will reduce further. At the time you have your last child, it has totally reduced. You will be driving like a sane human being. That was insanity. But do you know why I'm using this illustration? I pushed the car to its limit. Then I could say this car can truly go at 200. Have you been pushed to your limit yet? Because some of you are driving at 60. I'm talking about your life is going at 60 kilometers per hour. You will get to your destination, but it will take you a long time. So ask your neighbor, how fast are you driving? <laughs> you, 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 they, they say speed kills. Speed, speed doesn't kill. Speed doesn't kill. Have you ever seen speed killing? It's recklessness that kills. It's not speed. If speed killed, then if you fly from here to Johannesburg, you should die. Are you getting what I'm saying? Speed doesn't kill. It's recklessness. How, how fast is your life? I'm talking about your internal combustion engines within you. How fast is it moving? You need to wake up. Solomon said, I've seen an error that proceeds from the ruler underneath the heavens servants are on horses princes are walking it should not be who are the princes we are the princes we are the sons of god here upon the face of the earth who are the servants they are those that are outside the kingdom but what you keep finding is that those outside the kingdom are the ones on horses those of us that are princes are walking. And not every one of them is doing 419. That's, that's a lie the devil will sell you. Once you see a man who's wealthy and doesn't have God, say no, they're all crooks. They're all 419. They're living off the largesse of government. No, many of them toil day and night. Talk to me someone. I want us to look at the writer of this passage and pardon me to talk about the ambidexterous nature of Paul. What does it mean to be ambidexterous? It's a terminology that basically means you can use both hands with equal efficiency. There are a few people like that that I've known. One is my in-law. He writes with his right. And when he's tired, he will write with his left. 
with the same dexterity. That's, that's kind of a rarity, but it shows you that you can develop your left hand if you're right-handed and you can develop your right hand if you're left-handed. Now, I'm not talking about necessarily about the use of your hands, uh, but when we speak about ambidexterity, it means if you have two hands, you use both of them, all the hands you have. If you have three hands, you use all, but you don't have three. So let me read you a scripture. I'm just going to stay with the scriptures primarily today. First Corinthians, oh Lord, chapter 15, verses 9 to 10. This is Paul speaking. For I am the least of the apostles, and I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, and you know the story, lots of Christians died under his watch. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's what we like to quote. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more than them all. Who is he talking about? The apostles. Yet not I, but it was still the grace of God that was laboring in me. Paul here is comparing himself. Well, he's speaking about the grace of God, but he compares himself to the apostles that were ahead of him. I am what I am by the grace of God. And the grace of God towards me was not in vain. However, he says, I labored more than all the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but it was the grace of God in me. We we need to balance grace and labor. Just like we need to balance uh, competence and character. Are you getting what I'm saying? And competence and grace. Many times what the average believer rests absolutely upon is the grace of God. The grace of God would do it. I hate to take my car to a car shop. And when I ask the, 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 the car mechanic, when will my motor vehicle be ready? He tells me, by, by Monday, by the grace of God. I usually tell them, remove grace from here. Now, it's not because I don't value the grace of God. But I've come to find out that when the average Nigerian gives you a time and attaches the grace of God to it, he's trying to tell you he will not be ready by that time. Tell me Monday, 6 p.m. Don't tell me by the grace of God. That's a constant. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's a constant. Let's leave the constant. Let's deal with the variable. You are the variable. Because we like to throw things on grace. Then you come on Monday, your vehicle is not, and, and it begins to tell you, the grace was not sufficient. <laughs> and yet his grace is sufficient for us. But it's not about the grace. It's about his competence and the variable that is called you. Say to your neighbor, the grace is constant. The issue is the variable. You are the variable. Paul was saying, I labored more than Peter. I labored more than Thomas. I labored more than John the Beloved. He might have seen all the revelations of heaven, but I labored more than him. The man of whom I am speaking. Let me tell you a little about him. He wrote three quarters. Of the New Testament. He established. Apostolic doctrine. For all the churches. Still relevant today. Through him. God made. An incursion. Into heathen nations. He said I fought with the beasts of Ephesus. 
It's not talking about cows in the bush. It's talking about demonic princes of Ephesus. But he said, I labored more than all the apostles. I want to show you a little bit of Paul's labor and his ambidexterity. Are you with me? Okay. And I'll address certain things and your belief systems. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 and be ready to take me to Acts chapter 18 from verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord Kai you, when, when I, I pray someone is listening when the man was writing this he was in prison but he called himself the prisoner of the Lord. Was he telling you it's the Lord that imprisoned me. I'm here as part of his will. He didn't say, I'm the, I, the prisoner of Rome. I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy. Give it to me in the King James. It says, worthy of the calling. The King James says, worthy of the vocation. Wherewith you are called. The calling is a vocation. How many of you know that you are called? But you're not called necessarily into fivefold ministry. As we find in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, there are some that are called to equip the saints and others are called as saints who will go to the marketplace to do the work of the ministry. Let me say it again for those who may be hearing this for the first time or need to hear this, there's a difference between the work of the ministry and the work of the sanctuary. Too many times we find people fighting for position in church as if that is the work of the ministry. But it is not the work of the ministry. Everything we do in the house, creating order, the ushering department and all the departments that help to function or function in the house and help to create order as simply doing the work of the sanctuary. The work of the ministry is your calling. Some are sent to the world of politics and government. That's, that's your pulpit. That's where you preach from. Some are sent to the world of the media. Some are sent to the world of entertainment. Some are sent to education. Some to most of us uh, are sent to family because we do get married if we don't we're a part of a family so we're a part of that and some are sent to religion and the religious mountain is the most dangerous one I was driving back last night from Kurudu On sight. I was listening to a preacher. He said, This is a killing church. We kill people here. Mountain of religion. We kill people here. <laughs> kill our enemies. I don't know where killing church is in the Bible. Those who go there. I keep saying that religion has messed up more lives than, you can, than even politics has. So say to your neighbor or ask your neighbor, what's your vocation? That's your calling. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. It's constant. It's there with you. Turn to Acts. And let me show you this. The Paul who's writing introduced himself. If you read the letters he wrote to the churches, he constantly introduced himself. Paul and a Apostle of Jesus Christ. That's his vocation. Okay? 
Many times when we refer to him, we refer to him as Paul the Apostle. But here's Acts chapter 18 and verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So, because he was of the same trade with them. Pause there for a moment. I thought that all there was to Paul's life was the apostolic call. But Paul had a trade. Because he was of the same trade with Priscilla and Aquila, he stayed with them and did what? Worked. For by occupation, they were tent makers. What was their trade? Okay, let me put it this way. What was Paul's vocation? An apostle. What was his occupation? A tent maker. He had a vocation. He had an occupation. And he wrote three quarters of the New Testament. Peter had a vocation. Had no occupation. He wrote first Peter, second Peter. The man who seemingly exhibited an ambidextrous expression seemingly did more. I'm reading this for a reason. Let's, let's read and, and I'll tell you my reason. Let's, let's read on. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. So you find the expression of his vocation every Sabbath he went to the synagogues. He reasoned with them. But he stayed amongst people who had the same trade with him. Let me tell you the reason why I'm sharing this with you. It's to help you out. Because sometimes in our heads, our minds are so fixed on our vocation that we believe that there is no permission from heaven for us to do any other thing. And I'm not just talking about pastors. I've, I've counseled people. They say, just leave me where I am. I am a civil servant. I am very civil. <laughs> Last week I went to the federal ministry and I went quarter to ten. <laughs> See me, JJC. All the doors were locked. I opened, opened, they were locked. A cleaner said to me, try that one. I'd be like, say, it did open. I went and opened, it was locked. I said, then they come this kind of time. It's called civil service. I get what I'm saying. I'm trying to disabuse the minds of those because I, it's something I keep hearing. This is me. I can't do anything. I like focus. Say to your neighbor, focus. 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 Now, are you telling me Paul was not focused? focused? 
And what amazes me is that God gave him an abundance of grace that enabled him to fulfill his vocation and also to express himself in a trade. The occupation was tent making. But the man made such impact upon the face of the earth that is echoing beyond his years. He's been dead and gone and yet he is speaking. He laid the foundations of the church. Peter caught the revelation, but he didn't lay the foundation. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It would take a, a Paul to show up and establish the foundation of the church. Establish apostolic doctrine. What does that mean? The end is simple. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The greatest assignment is to present every man before Christ, a perfect man. That's, that's the essence or that's what apostolic doctrine is. How much are you doing? Let me ask your neighbor. How much are you doing? Ask your neighbor, <laughs> how much are you doing? Acts chapter 20, verse 17. I need to run through this quickly. Now, when I read this, anyway, <laughs> let's, let's go on. Just try to say some things at certain times. Acts chapter 20. Paul is writing, what, what had happened here is that he had sent for the Ephesian elders. He was in Miletus. He sent for the Ephesian elders to come and meet him because he had a message to deliver to them. Verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God. That's verse 32. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Do you know what this means? I've not seen anybody with anything and I wish I had it. Do, do you get what that means? I've not seen anyone driving a car and I to see this kind of my own. I have not coveted anyone's gold, coveted anyone's silver, and do you know the challenge with the church? One of the greatest evils in the church is covetousness. This is the antidote to covetousness. What is it? Work, labor, Toil in grace. Be ambidextrous. Use all that God has put upon the inside of you. Listen to me. When he said this, there was a reason and we've read it. He said we labored with our hands. So if I'm laboring with my hands and I am earning my own wages, I don't need to covet anybody's thing. I buy my own. There was a time when there was this bless me, uh, no, you, no claim, uh, claim, claim it, name it and claim it. You see somebody's car, you say, I claim your car. You are a thief, you are a robber. Ole. Olo do rabata. You are a thief. Brother, I claim, don't claim my car. Go and walk and buy your own. Are you getting what I'm saying? I claim your shoes. And I still meet people who do it. See, drive a vehicle, they say, man of God, I claim you are a thief. It's covetousness. 
Ojukokoro. I don't know what it means. Because Kokoro is insect. <laughs> Kokoro. Uh -huh. Kokoro. That's the one I know. You're a thief. Naming and claiming. Thinking that because you put your hand on a car. Do you get what I'm saying? Or you put your hand on a house. It will automatically appear. After you have put your hand on it, ask the man, how did you build a house? Are you getting what I'm saying? Warn and withdraw from those who walk, who walk disorderly, who want to claim everything. For they know they claim your wife. I have coveted no one silver or gold or apparel. Won't you be glad to be able to say this? Next verse. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you might support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. He said, I've shown you with these hands. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. What else do you need to hear? What else do you need to be told? These hands. Sometimes you read it, it sounds like he's boasting. But we know he's not. He recognized the grace of God in his life. He said, these hands have ministered to my own necessities. It supplied all my need. You need to understand that there are two schools of thought and particularly when it comes to the context from which Paul is speaking. There are two schools of thought. Peter and the other apostles did not do what Paul did. They lived literally of the gifts of people. Was that wrong? No. A laborer is worthy of his wages. You do not muzzle the ox that treads the corn. No one goes to battle at his own expenses. But Paul came with a difference and said, if I don't show you an example, you'll have all kinds of lazy freeloaders all over the place. Jesus himself set an example. He said it clearly. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Think about those words for one split second. It is more blessed. Now, it means if it is more blessed to give than to receive, it means it is blessed to receive. But one is more blessed than the other. So when people give to you, you say, oh, I was blessed last week. With a million dollars. But the same week I gave out two million dollars. I was more blessed by my giving. Than by what I received. God needs to change our paradigm. Give me the message translation. I know it's clear. But I just like to read this so people can see. I'm turning you over to God, a marvelous God, whose gracious word can make you into what he wants you to be. 
and give you everything you could possibly need in this community of holy friends. I've never, as you so well know, had any taste for wealth or fashion. It's got taste. I'm not into all these finicky, frenzy, ephesism. No. I dress well because I represent God's kingdom. That's all. I have no problem with your Gucci bag. But I don't need to buy a Gucci to represent the kingdom. Are you getting what I'm saying? If not, the church of Jesus Christ will be reduced to a Gucci. We just insist that every woman in Lighthouse must buy Louis Vuitton. Whether it's fake, (laughs) fake original, original fake, or original, just carry one. And if yours is not, you can take you 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 you, you can take uh, nail 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 and write with your own hand Louis Vuitton. It will reduce the, the cross of Jesus to nonsense. I've been places where, when you enter, you look you look at your. I've been there. I don't want to mention names. I've been there. Look at his shoe. So his shoe is one five. <laughs> Look at his suit. He say he bought it in Katako Market in Joss. Five K. Look at everything. He say go and sit, sit. That's a res- special reserve seat for you. <laughs> I've been there. I've had leaders. don't like to talk showed me their wardrobe and every shirt had a monogram their name was on it bespoke tailoring hallelujah I'll show you some scriptures in the book of proverbs that addresses this. Know that you represent the kingdom. Know that it's about decency all the time. You can't stand before people. They are seeing your cleavage and you represent the kingdom. Thank you. You know, new terminologies are, it's called cleavage kingdom. <laughs> because instead of their eyes being on you or on the Lord, their eyes. <laughs> Tap someone by your side and say, hope, hope they're not talking about you. Part of the reason is all those people you watch on that thing called TV that are satanically influenced to change your dressing. Muhammad Ali's daughter came to visit him. You've heard the story. Dressed skimpily and he called her and said, Sit, let me sit on my lap. Let me tell you a story. Gold is mined deep in the earth. That's what makes it precious. Diamonds are mined deep and they're difficult to find. That's what makes it precious. He said to her, 
and, and well sought after too. He said to her, you see these things? They are so precious. They shouldn't be exposed to all men to see. That's Cassius Clay that became Muhammad Ali. You are Muhammad Ali that became Cassius Clay. And yet, said, hide those precious things so that only one man will mine it. When you think about Jesus, just trying to show you, connect you with certain truths. When you think about Jesus, what comes to your mind? What comes to your mind? Savior of the world. Died to redeem all of humanity. That's what comes to mind. How many years did he live on the face of the earth? 33 and a half. When did he begin his ministry? At 30. Three and a half years later, he died. But did you ever consider that before the ages of 12 to 30, he was a carpenter? 18 years of his life were devoted to earning money. Oh God. Making ends meet. If we use that terminology, it would be inconsistent with him because he's the creator of all things. But what I make, what is interesting is that Jesus could have just from the age of 12, which is when you enter officially into manhood as a as a Jewish child, he could have just been saying, Bread come forth. Milk, come forth. By the time I wake up, I want to see seven bottles of milk. All the plates be washed. Do you know you could have said that and they'll be washed? Wood appear. Heat manifest. Do you know he could have done all that? But he didn't. i read to you just two basic scriptures and then we'll We'll go to the book of Proverbs. All right. Mark chapter 6 and verse 3. Or we'll read from verse 1. Then he went out from there and came to his own country and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue and many hearing him were astonished saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter? Look at how they knew him. Is this not the carpenter? The son of Mary, brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us. So they were offended at him. How, when he went back to his own city, how did they recognize him? Ah, we know this guy now. Jesus and sons. Furniture Company Limited. How can a carpenter suddenly begin to do mighty works and now he says he's the son of God for 18 years of his life he was known as a carpenter. Now let me ask you a question. When Jesus functioned as a carpenter, was he making furniture for free? No. No. 
I'll show you certain things. When he was born, wise men, there are not three. Wise men came from the east. Because we need to be reminded that they're not three wise men. They were wise men that brought three gifts. Wise men came from the east and they brought him what? Gifts. What were the gifts? Frankincense, myrrh, and gold. They brought it to who? What did his parents do with it? They kept it as memento. So that when it goes, see the thing we didn't bring for you. They sold it to sustain him. Now that's the son of God. That you naturally assume that heaven should just be raining uh, bread. Loads of bread. They would, at night, they would just be in, on their roof. They come out and pack bread, milk, sugar, and, and all the kinds of things. Yams. And all. You would think heaven should just be raining, but God would order the steps of wise men. They would bring gifts because they were going to go through a time of turmoil and going to Egypt. They, they couldn't work. They needed to be sustained. When Jesus was 12, just like every Jewish child, he needed to learn a trade. His father was a carpenter. If you read the book of Matthew, the same question was, 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 was addressed. Is this not the son of the carpenter? That's how it says this in Matthew. But Mark captured another dimension. Is this not the carpenter? From 12, he went into furniture workshop. And he was selling to make money. The son of God. The creator of the whole earth. Understood the dynamics. Of work and money. And I can tell you that for those 18 years. Neither he nor his parents needed to beg. Can I also add this to you? That the furniture that Jesus made was world class. What do I mean? I'm not, I'm not saying it was Gucci furniture. It was well made. If the son of God will make you a chair and then you go and sit on it and it will collapse, one leg will break. There's no way he can save the world. Are you getting what I'm saying? He'll make you a bed, you lie on it, and, and you lie on the ground, and then he tells you, I am the savior. You say, go and sit. <laughs> so go, go save the work of your hands first. Must have made perfect furniture. Must have made furniture that was so good and so strong that it could be transferred from one generation to can you imagine furniture being transferred as a legacy that happens in the western world it doesn't we we our own we dash it out or we use it as firewood but it must have made perfect furniture why was he a furniture maker if you must build men you must build inanimate things first if you must build a house set upon this rock, I will build my church. Then let me teach you, first of all, how to build a house of wood that will not collapse on the inhabitants there. Or you think he went in there and was just saying, uh, Thomas wants two chairs, chair up here. Went and bought wood, sought the wood, designed, created, fastened using available technology, coated it for preservation, sold it, collected money, honored his earthly parents, kept some for himself. So he could buy his own clothes. Or you think at 29, it was still Mary and Joseph that were buying him. Say, son, Christmas clothes. <laughs> you buy Christmas, Christmas clothes. <laughs> Can 
Don't you neighbor as you wake up and smell the coffee. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4. I have four scriptures in the book of Proverbs to read to you. And then we'll close today. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4. He who has a slack hand becomes poor. But the hand of the diligent makes rich. Message translation. I want the message for all of this. Sloth makes you poor. Do you know a sloth? When the Bible says, be not slothful. A sloth is an animal. The slowest animal package on earth. If a sloth needs to move from this wall to that, it may take it a week. And it's not a small animal. Then he will hook and sleep and then wake up again and and sleep. Never in a hurry. Takes its time. Be not slothful. It's to take on the nature of the sloth. The man who is slothful becomes poor. But it is diligence that brings wealth. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 24. The diligent finds freedom. Give it to me in King James first, then the message. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. All kinds of pressures will come that will not will, will, will just not be able to bear with. Uh, give it to me in the, in the message. The diligence finds freedom in the work. The lazy are oppressed by work. Are you still with me? Proverbs chapter 12 verse 11. King James. He who tills his land. Do you have a land? You remember my message? He who tills his land shall be satisfied with bread. But he that follows vain persons is void of understanding. Message. The one who stays on the job has food on the table. The witless chase whims and fancies. Uh. NIV. He who walks his land will have abundant food. But he who changes fantasies lacks judgment. Frivolities, fantasies. What are fantasies? Let me share with you a fantasy that most of you had. You ladies had. You lie on your bed and you're thinking about Prince Charming. He's six foot two. He has six pack. He is light skinned, or for some, dark and handsome. He walks in style. His speech is right. When he comes and approaches you, he says, Hi, baby. And that fantasy is sustained until you get married. (laughs) 
He doesn't have six pack. Like <laughs> he has one pack. Like a pastor shared with us, mobile pulpit. <laughs> Two weeks ago, we, we went <laughs> in, in Kaduna after Kingdom Power and Glory. We went for dinner and we met this pastor who said he called um, Pastor Joe back and he said, How come? Uh, what are you people doing? How come you're serving overseer? doesn't have mobile pulpit so he called me back he said see all of us were having mobile pulpit. i said what's mobile pulpit say <laughs> so you, say, you can you don't need pulpit it will rest on your stomach <laughs> pastor, pastor victor Ademi had another twist he said man of god you can't be a bishop <laughs> why he said if you hang the cross, there's nothing the cross can sit on. That needs something it can rest on. So you see this guy? He has mobile pulpit. And yet you have to say, I do. It's called fantasizing. And many people dwell there who you lie on your bed, you're like, you imagine yourself in Dubai. Five-star hotel. Burj Al Arab. You, you just, your briefcase is loaded with dollars. <laughs> your car is a, is a Maybach. Just, just waiting. And, and you imagine all of that until your phone rings. I don't want to call the name of the phone. You know it's not Nokia. Neither is it iPhone. Then you wake up. Your bubble and your fantasy is burst. Welcome to reality. The hand of the diligent will be a rule. But those who chase fantasies lack understanding. So are you chasing fantasies? Proverbs 31. This one will punch off feminists below the belt. Below the belt. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what, the son of my vows, give not your strength unto women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. <laughs> There's a way that destroys kings. That's, that's not a subject today. But he mentions it, women. It is not for kings. O Lemuel, that's another name for Solomon. For kings to drink wine or for princes strong drink. The shark. What happens? They drink and forget the law. Then they pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to die. And wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty. Now, <laughs> there's a play of words here. 
Because if you shark, you forget your poverty. When the shark wears out, you are in your poverty. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. It's the reason why many people drink. It's the reason why many people smoke weed. They want to get out of reality. The thing is, it takes you out for a moment. But afterwards, (laughs) like a balloon inflated, you go up. Then the air begins to leak out you. Your legs will touch the ground. So much wisdom here. Go on, please. Just give me three verses together. Open your mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Those who can't speak. Open your mouth. Judge righteously. Plead the cause of the poor and needy. He's talking to Solomon the king. Who can find a virtuous woman? This is where I'm going. For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that it will have no need for spoil. Is not, and I explain this, is not pressured. Uh, Buy me jewelry. Christmas is coming. I want to wear gold. There's Dubai gold. I want to wear lace. I want to wear, if you can, wear Christmas clothes. Where do we get the culture from? Even Christmas tree, where is it from? It looks nice, oh. This is not, you think Jesus died on this kind of tree? (laughs) Can you imagine Jesus hanging on a big tree like this with lights? Special effects. It's not a a 20th century savior. (laughs) But it looks nice. Santa Claus is on it. Who is he? As long as it doesn't destroy our faith or conflict with the word of God, no problem. Maybe a tradition that's been received. As long as it doesn't affect our true value in placing our premium on Christ instead of on Santa Claus, that's fine. But who can find a pressure? The hand of a husband is so safe. He's not under pressure to perform. So he doesn't, he doesn't need to let me just satisfy this woman and be put under unnecessary pressure. Next verse. I just want to show you. She would do him good and no evil all the days of his life. Now watch this. And let's read it from the message translation. Because if a woman can be this, what about you? As a woman, what about you? As a man. She's never spiteful. She treats him generously all her life long. She shops around for the best yarns and cottons and enjoys knitting and sewing. That's work. She's like a trading ship that sails to faraway places and brings back exotic surprises. She's up before dawn. Preparing breakfast for her family and organizing her day. She looks over a field. She doesn't say, honey, we need to buy a field. She buys it. With her own money. And then with money she has put aside. Because many women will spend it all. She plants a garden. First thing in the morning, she dresses for work. Rolls up her sleeves, eager to get started. She senses the worth of her work. And is in no hurry to call it quits for the day. She is skilled in the crafts of home and hearth that's baking. Diligent in homemaking. She is quick to assist anyone in need. Reaches out to help the poor. She doesn't worry about her family when it snows. Their winter clothes are already mended and ready to wear. She makes her own clothing and dresses in colorful linens and silks. When you see a woman like that, gorgeously dressed, 
worked with her own hands. Whatever she wears, she has a right to wear. As balanced to what I've said before. If she chooses to wear a, a designer Tom Ford dress and it costs her $2,000, she walked for it. Don't be envious. Eh? See what in the, They don't even value money. A poverty mentality is one of the most disastrous things you can ever you can ever in a church the people that say what do they do with their money they're the ones that don't give they're the ones that don't tithe is a known fact the ones that give generously they've moved on they don't talk it's not the issue but why is it 2000 naira what will they do with it you know where they belong. We're paying five million naira for this. We raise how much for equipment? Some people talk when we say we're going to buy equipment for the church. What are they spending so much on? Now you're enjoying great equipment. And no complaints anymore. One microphone, 50,000 naira. Is that not a waste? I know somebody that bought one five. It's called Ahuja. When you speak into it, even you, you'll be like, ah, who they talk? Because you won't recognize your own voice. She makes her own clothing and dresses in colorful linens and silks. Her husband is greatly respected when he deliberates with the city fathers. She designs gowns and sells them, brings the sweaters she needs to the dress shops. Her clothes are well made and elegant. She always faces tomorrow with a smile. When she speaks, she has something worthwhile to say. And she always says it kindly. She keeps an eye on everyone in her household and keeps them all busy and productive. Do something! Her children respect and bless her. Her husband joins in with words of praise. Many women have done wonderful things, but you have outclassed them all. Can we have men and women that would outclass other people? Look at the level of industry. Look at the level of entrepreneurship. Look at the dimensions of ambidexterity that is seen in this woman. Look at all the different dimensions of her life. And she's one person. Stop chasing fantasies. She considers a field. She buys it. And with money she has reserved, she plants a field. Agriculture. Property development. Fashion designer. Trade. Name it. One woman. You've got good food. Husband. Children. Household. What about you? Now, if your wife is like that, what should you as a husband become? <laughs> head of house. Only head in talk. <laughs> Are you getting what I'm saying? Husband man. I can't stand lazy men who live off their wives of foolish and senseless young men who are looking for a well made woman to marry something is wrong with you there is dignity in labor hello
is where I like to close. I pray that every one of you will get out of here with a new resolve. Work hard. He that tills his land will have bread, plenty of bread on his table. You sleep and you dream of New York. My brother used to have a friend in, in secondary school. I don't know where he is today. But the guy will wake up from his bunk bed. And it will stretch. Say, ah, reminds me of New York. He had never traveled. <laughs> Outside Nigeria before in his life, you're chasing fantasies. Those who are struggling, and you're trying to falsify records to get a visa to travel. If you are diligent, you will go. You will go and come. You will go and come and you will refuse to go and live there. If you're diligent, you won't have a visa problem. Because all they want to see is enough proof that you will return. That's all, that's all that guarantees you for a visa. That you won't abscond and be washing dead bodies. <laughs> or toilets there. That's, that's all. Diligence is the key. If you can go now, it probably means it's not your time. When you're, t oh God, and you determine your time. Put your hands to work. The grace of God is a constant. The variable is the issue. Let's, I, I don't want to say let's put the grace of God aside. But let's do the needful. And then we can say in confidence to heaven, Lord, I've played my own part. Provide your grace. Provide your enablement. Make a way for me where there seems to be no way. Work. Work. Toil. Learn. Till your land. You may have a job till your land. It's not limited to the job you have. It's the reason why, you know, I, I was speaking, and I don't know who, uh, it, was, it was my sister, Esther, who was saying, when many generals and soldiers re retire from the army, the only place you find them in is officer's mess. My, fa my, my father and Lord used to say, I don't know whether it was or, or whether, whether it's accurate, I've never been to officer's mess. Is that what do they do in officers' mess? They mess themselves. <laughs> that may not be entirely true. Simple reason. The man can't function outside his vocation. Can't do anything. Once there's a cessation of job or that assignment, they become literally redundant and useless. can't do anything. And it's not just soldiers alone. Civil servants too. And the reality is that you won't stay there forever. Sometimes some winds blow that you cannot determine. The fact that you are in a, a child of God does not even mean that you will keep your job right through your life. May go to work one day and a letter will be waiting for you. 
saying, sorry, your services are no longer needed. What will you do? In Luke chapter 16, there's a story of an unjust ruler who received a worthy commendation from his boss. He had been cheating the boss or news had come to him, whether it was founded or not. Then he had been cheating his boss. And his boss called him and he said, I'm taking your job from you today. And there the man said, what shall I do? I cannot beg. To dig, I'm ashamed. And then he said, I know what to do. And he used these negotiating skills to secure his future. And then when the good, when the master heard what he had done, he commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. And then Jesus made a profound statement. The children of this world in their generation, it means in every dispensation and generation are wiser than the children of light. And then he throws a bombshell. Therefore, Use unrighteous mammon to make friends. And that's one scripture that many of us, is he saying bribe people with money? He's saying use when, when resources come your way. Have a disposition in your heart to help, to bless, to give, to support the weak. You never can tell. There may come a day when you may need such help. But if you use money, uh, you said to make enemies. But if you use, if I'm giving Pastor Gabriel money, hoping that he will give me back, that's, that's the wrong motive. I remember a young man when I was in university, he was a part of our church. He got into NDA and I was supporting him. He's a colonel, just been promoted colonel right now. Supporting, and I was doing that to many people, many. Sending money every time someone was going or he came on holidays and he was going to school. His parents couldn't support him. It was a little over a year ago, one day, he, he, he had called me before and he said he wanted to see me and I was not in town. So he called again and he came and he said, Pastor, are you in town? He said, yeah. He said, I want to see you. He came to my house, sat on my sofa. How are you doing? I call him soldier, my son in the faith. And he said, Pastor, you know they give us vehicles as part of the package? He said, God said to give mine to you. It was a 307, the one I drive around. He needed the car. I didn't want to collect it. I, I feel like that at times. I was dumbfounded. It wasn't that I didn't have a car. I had. But he said, God said to give this to you. And I've come. And for a minute, I couldn't say a word. The car was parked outside. And I prayed with him. Three months. Everything changed. He just don't want to say it. It was sensitive information. But everything changed. He called me with excitement. He said, that's the reason why I had to sow that seed. Was I looking for him to, to give me a car? No. Don't invest in people's lives expecting them to return to me. That's a wrong motive. That's why I drive my 307 with pride. Uh, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, you see me. It's manual transmission. I like it. It gives me a sense of control. Uh, I can see a trailer and I can determine mm -hmm. when you're driving automatic, you press your throttle, the car will say, you won't make her go. <laughs> you're not taking that risk. I 
wish I could talk about seed sowing. Made investment in people's lives. I'm not talking about preaching the word of God. As an undergraduate, not many people are sending to school. University. And I was in university too. Some didn't do well. They absconded. They didn't finish school. Can I have one more minute? There's a young man. He comes here occasionally. I was paying his fees to secondary school. He was living with me. He had this American dream. I don't want to call his name. Every time his accent had changed, he had never crossed. <laughs> you know, yeah, man. Uh, when, when I get out of the States, um, we, we, we're going to bounce. We, we gonna, I'm like, you, you, you have not been anywhere. Face your books. Started playing basketball. I said, well, why, why are you playing? He said, you know, when, when I get to the States, I may, I, may, I may not have a job. So first thing I need to do is, is play basketball so I, I can make some money. Uh, 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 I dunk. I spunk. <laughs> Face your books. My wife knows him well, knows the story. He did his GCE. He refused to show FF9 is, is America. <laughs> he never showed me the results. Eventually, I left school and he had to go stay with his brother. Now, it's been at least 18 years. His life has not amounted to anything. He's still holding on to the American dream. He's still dunking and spunking and bouncing and doing everything. If he had stayed with his academics, 18 years, he still comes in around and I still have to give him money and say, to transport him back. How can you waste your life chasing frivolities and fantasies? And yet I remember Michael who's a medical doctor today. Used to send him and give him money to school. At the time he came, he said, Pastor, I can't keep coming every time. Give me some money. I will buy books. I will sell to my students, to, to, my, to my colleagues. He will buy medical books. He will sell, make money. He, he didn't own one medical book right through school. He was borrowing from his friends. He will sell to them, borrow from them, Today, the medical doctor practicing in Zaria, doing extremely well. And someone else is chasing frivolities, spunking, dunking, and bouncing. I believe in work. I believe that in all labor there's profit. Not some all. All. I work hard daily. Spiritually, mentally, physically. In all ramifications. You have no excuse. Have you been blessed? 
understand when you feel this way. 